All right, uh, please keep your your line muted and your video turned off. Um, that helps prevent distractions um, from the presenters. Type any questions you might have in the chat or wait until the question and answer section to unmute your line. And we've designated um, a portion of time at the end of our presentations today for question and answers. Um, I wanted to mention the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service is the host of today's webinar. I'm Abigail Appleman, it's great to meet you. Um, and also in the chat, Feel free to tell us who you are, a little bit about yourself, um, get to know each other a little bit, and um, I will be dropping some things in the chat as we go. I will put my contact information there. If you have suggestions for other topics in urban ag that you would like to hear about from NRCS um, or ongoing, you know, questions, wanting follow up, anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. And as we go throughout the presentations today, we have a couple of links to share with you, and so I'll make sure those get there. So to get things started today, we have our NRCS state soil scientist, Yuri Plowden. Yuri. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to take this time to introduce our main speaker. Um, I'll be uh, talking to you later on about our Soil Your Endies campaign, but in the meantime, we have a very packed presentation. Um, this is, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kefeni Kajela. He is a resource soil scientist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, working primarily in Western Pennsylvania. He holds a doctorate in environmental science from Oklahoma State University, a master's degree in resource assessment and development planning from the University of East Anglia in England. And he also has a master's in agronomy from the Krasnodar Institute of Tropical and Subtropical Agriculture in the former Soviet Union. He has worked with NRCS since 2003 as a field soil scientist doing soil survey work in Southeast PA, uh, as a soil conservationist working in Lancaster PA, and now as a resource soil scientist in Western PA. He has published work on heavy metals leaching in different environments, and um, he was the recipient of the NRCS 2021 National Civil Rights Award, and he chaired a board that he works internationally as well. So he chaired a board that worked closely with local organizations and government agencies in Ethiopia to plant five billion trees. And that work, which he is still involved with, is now expanding from Ethiopia into neighboring countries of Eritrea, South Sudan, Djibouti, Kenya, and Somalia. So with that, I am very happy to uh, hand it over to Dr. Kefeni Kajalia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for uh, your introduction. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I'm um, just the first a series of the first webinar on urban soil to share with you. And uh, this is just the start, and we are hopefully we'll go through as time goes, and next time uh, with more information as comes available and to share with you. And uh, can you see, Yuri? Yeah, could you see my the screen, the soil, the first page of your presentation? Yeah, I can, I, I can see now. Yeah, the first presentation. Okay, great. So my today's presentation is on soil properties and management in urban ecosystem for urban ag. Uh, as introductory background on urban soil for urban farming, NRC service all agriculture, large or small, conventional or organic or non-organic. As agriculture continue to grow in a new direction, NRC's conservation assistance is growing along with it. By bringing cultivation the opportunity to both rural and urban area, we address many needs. The primary task is restoring the health of the soil, which ultimately restores the health of the people. The urban soil is intended to give planning official in the people who live in urban areas an introduction to soils. 
It provides information important in planning and managing land resources in a manner that help to prevent or mitigate problems associated with the sedimentation, contamination, runoff, and structural failure. And the primary goal of the soil survey is to help people who live in a city understand soil to help them know where and how to get information about soil. Knowing about soil and its potential and limitation help urban planners. Javier. And those living in urban areas to make good decisions about using their soil as a basic and valuable resources. So NRCS here in PA is starting to focus more on urban soil as they have unique characteristics from natural soils. So soil in general is soil, to be honest with you. There is no difference between rural or urban, but what makes the difference is activity we do that makes the soil from one different from one to another. So our major area of focus to urban soil are three. This is something which always we do wherever we go, whether it is land farm or small farm. One is the soil properties. The focus is the soil properties, the quality and quantity. Second, risks posed to urban farmers, at the same time consumers. Third, if that happens, then we have to look for how to mitigate. Mitigation involves on the ground management, which is nutrient accumulation in the soil, and above ground management, which is raised seed bed management in terms of uh, urban soil. It includes also high tunnel management and also a container production, and more importantly, the soil test, because we destroyed that soil, we disturbed that soil, we add so many things, contaminate the soil. So it is our responsibility to do a soil test to make sure that that soil is safe for production and for consumers. So this is always a question, always come to the mind of everybody. What is urban soil? What is urban soil? Urban soil is a soil material having man-made surface layer material that has been produced by mixing, filling, or by contamination of land surface in urban and suburban areas. This is what makes urban soil different from a normal soil, a natural soil. So why do we need, what's the importance of urban soil, why do we need to study? As I said, once the soil is spoiled, contaminated, our task is to look at the soil health and make sure it is that soil is secure for urban consumers. So urban soil health implies assessment of multiple internal in independent system. Urban soil security includes goal of the sustainability and at the same time strategy. Because you have to regain balance of organic carbon input loss. And at the same time, soil erosion production release in the loss of nutrient, which is heavy metals. So, here is a point. When we say urban soil, we have to identify what the soil quality is about. We have to understand first what the soil quality itself. Before I read the definition, please look at the soil horizon and the plant. How both actually are parallel and convenient and very much naturally comfortable root distribution on the ground leaf plants everything the soil textures the structures everything actually is the same as a natural system that is the way the soil below the ground 
the plant above the ground, they negotiate to leave. So the soil quality is the capacity of a specific kind of soil to function within a natural or managed ecosystem boundaries to sustain plant and animal productivity, maintain or enhance water and air quality, and support human health and habitation. That is what the soil quality is about. So that is not the case in urban soil. There are as activities associated in urban soil which makes the urban soil contaminated. The major one, mineral working, coal, brick clay, lead, iron, limestone, chalk, sand and gravel, thin slate, refuse, household waste, scrubbing the cars, third, industrial work, Brick work, chemical works, gas works, iron the steel works. Those are more example we can take in Pittsburgh area. Uh, the, the transportation efforts, airfield, canals, railroad, roads, we can take in uh, Harrisburg and the Philadelphia areas. So there are two different way of contaminating the soil, different activities associated with urban soil. Here is an example. Just let's start with the natural, the right side, the natural soil profile. If you see, the top a horizon is perfectly dead on the ground. The subsoil, what you call B horizon, is at it is undisturbed. And of course, the parent material, the C horizon, is below. That's how the nature of that particular soil is supposed to be. Look at the same soil on the left side, urban soil. How much garbage, how much debris. You can't say is this top horizon or sub horizon or sea horizon or are messed up, mixed up with so many things. So even the root, the plant cannot even take. If they start growing, they may go end up on the leaf, on the, on the paper or bricks or paved ground. Here is another one. The soil are highly disturbed. Top soil is removed, inverted, eroded, lack of fertility, compaction surface, excessive water in the storm water runoff because the soil is, is a paved ground. There is no percolation to the ground. Polluted, asphalt, concrete, heavy metals, local manufacturing fallout, Constructing debris in the chemicals. You can see how much urban soil is disturbed. When we dig down, we see all the disturbance. Same way, human artifact buried in the soil. Multiple deposit of human transport materials. The buried building debris contain. You can see on each one how much we are disturbing the soil. Transported topsoils over transported coal slag with artifact over dredge spoil deposit. So all are there when we actually see that on the top, we see, oh, the urban soil is, oh, good soil, we go ahead. But when you dig down, you end up with so much problems, actually. Coal mine areas, look how plants are dying on the top. You see how much the coal mine under is going on. You can see construction debris on the right side, so much metals, so much cement, so much creeks. How do we grow on those stuff? That is the problem with that. This is just a site of special, special concerns in industrial manufacture areas. This area also used to be a farmland, and now it is almost contaminated. So when we say Contaminants, that is something also that really we have to understand from the point of view of soil health, uh, either producer or planners, we have to understand when we say contaminant, there is no 100% non-contaminant soils. Naturally, the soil have leads, the soil has arsenic, 
chrom, nickel, zinc in the soil naturally. But if that le the level of those metals are below tolerable level, still it is okay. Only we call soil is contaminated when the T value, the tolerable level is above. Just let's take lead. EPA normally say 400 parts per million below that from zero to 400 says okay. But when you check the soil and found 600, 700, that is the time where the soil is contaminated. So by definition, any substance in the soil that exceeds naturally occurring level in the post-human health risk is a soil contaminant. The biggest risk of soil contamination are in urban areas and the, and the former industrial site caused by human activities. This is what I always, in terms of urban soil, I will keep you in mind, always keep that in mind. The soil is the earth's kidney. The earth's kidney. Look at our kidney, how it functions, how the liquid go up and down in our body system. The same way the soil is the earth's kidney. Contaminants can trickle through the soil and negate to our water supply. So the soil in urban area is Earth's kidney. You can see below here, oil that drip from your car on the pavement will get into soil and the storm water pollution polluting them. So this is when you talk of contaminants. How are people exposed to contaminants? We always say, oh, heavy metal in the soil, from the soil. Not only that, there are several ways humans can be exposed to soil contaminants. The most common are four. One, ingesting soil. Maybe most of you are surprised. What, I'm eating soil? No, could be. Young children may be particularly susceptible, susceptible as they play in base soil, contaminated by heavy metals or whatever. Children might breathe in dust particles that naturally disperse during play. If an item like lettuce is growing in soil with contaminants, the leaves could be covered. The biggest risk of ingesting soil happens when the soil is left bare. Covering soil with grass or other plant and mulching will reduce the risk of contaminants. That is one. Second, breathing volatiles and dust. Construction or demolition work, which happen every time. Mining operations, which always happens. Or poor landscape effort can make soil dust. Through dust, we can inhale, and that is also another way of actually getting contaminated. Third, absorbing through skin. Creosote is a common material used to preserve wood in the United States, which leach out in the contaminated soil. I have seen creosote up in Maine when the timber is extremely actually by working there very much every time. In Vermont, you can see also the same thing. Creosote is a very common preservative actually used for wood. So that is another way which go to your skin. Fourth one is eating food growing in contaminated soil. Fruit vegetables, leaf vegetables, root vegetables, all take up and accumulate contaminant. But I know it is differently, but they do that. Here's the advice in this situation. Before you put a lot of work into your home or community garden. You want to make sure the soil is safe from contamination. Some potential diagnostic properties. Can we, uh, I'm not a soil scientist or um, somebody, can I identify something? Yes, in some situation we can do. You don't have to be a soil scientist. Some potential diagnostic properties. One, depth of disturbed or mixed layer. We have seen the horizon. Of course, you could distinguish that. Can be directly measured. You can see how long those debris went down, paved ground down to the 
parent material, you can see those, you can measure it, you can say. Then you compare with the natural in the disturbed soil. That gives you another potential diagnostic property. Second, depth of topsoil. That is very important for land management, estimation of soil biomass, and available water content inflammation. Yes, you can see that can be directly measured. The topsoil, we have seen that the topsoil there, and the other side, the topsoil was removed or disturbed, mixed. That is an observation. You don't have to be soil scientist, you can observe. Third, concentration of toxic metals. Not usually identified, this should be go through lab. Soluble salt concentrations, these are important for land reclamation, ecological planning, the plant grows. Can be directly measured using a, a conductivity probe, EC. There's a simple tool, you can use it, you can be in a lab, or if it is portable one, also you can use it and you can identify. Nature of substrata, important for estimation of potential toxicity. This is a very, very important thing to see. Uh, we have to look at the parent materials very closely because sometimes there are some metals related to parent materials. And in urban situations, when contamination added to the existing one, to that parent material, you have elevated level of heavy metals. I can give you an example. In limestone area, in urban area, you have a very high level of calcium. Why? In a limestone area, high calcium content and a parent material naturally grown. However, in the city of the had a pavement and the cement and all which contain calcium, when you add, then you get over what is required. So then you are contaminating the soil. The best way to see that one is limestone area in urban and a limestone area in non-urban and put take samples, bring it to the lab, check it and compare the result. You can immediately see that there is an eleva elevated number of calcium and other elements. Then vegetative cover. That is, you can measure it because important for the ability of pro protection soil from erosion and surface scrapping. You can do that one. So, one of the major issues also is the physical disturbance of the urban farming. Uh, you can see and the left side, you can see the compacted, compacted and the footpaths. It those hold excess water, reduce aeration, reduce biological activities, increase storm water runoff, then restricted root growth, reduce plant uptake of water and the nutrient, increase flood due to runoff, increase water pollution is another reason for compaction. The compaction is an issue. Then we'll come up how to go, how to deal with the management aspect will come in a minute. Compaction is one of the problem with create contamination in the soil. Then how do we manage this urban soil? That are just manageable way of doing urban soil. There are so many complicated advanced technology you can manage, but this one is what you can do it with a low input. You can manage your urban soil. One, cover crops, mulch, compost. Also keep the soil acidity as much as you can between five to seven. Another one is if there is a soil is contaminated and very hard to grow anything because of, for example, the lead, like in Pittsburgh areas, I always recommend them to raise seed beds using imported soil to minimize the risk of heavy metal. If you move about, about a foot deep topsoil, you minimize the risk of heavy metals. Also, it could be locally from forest or farms. You can do that one. 
And the most important, with for anybody is necessary for urban farmer or producer is the soil test regularly. That is an avoidable action. Actually, we have to do that. Here is a restoring degraded soil, which is compacted. Look at two plants. Decompact tillage or other physical manipulation. Repopulate soil organism, include roots, and mainly with organic matter, recreating topsoil. You can see the right side how the when the compaction is less, how much the root distribution is well growing and how much the plant actually is growing very well. So that is one way of re restoring degraded soil or compacted soil. Urban soil is uh, geochemistry is strongly influenced by human activities. Everybody knows because it, it requires compost, mulch, seedbed. As you can see, a red seedbed garden how much the soil fertility is actually can see in the farm. A garden near home is a plant, how much the plants actually growing very well because of the, the management of the soil with compost, with mulch and seedbed. When you talk of seedbed, there are certain things you have to keep in mind always. Use wood, stone, brick, plastic to construct the sides of the, the production bed. Not concerned with the wood, as I said before, the COC, the preservative. We have to be careful. Preserving wood are very, very dangerous, so we have to make sure when we use, we avoid those. Concrete can contribute to alkaline of the soil also. Construct bed should be at least a foot deep to three to three, four feet wide. You can see there a foot deep, three to four feet wide. It's always good to line with landscape fabric, cheesecloth or other fabric must allow good drainage. Fill the container with clean soil. Mineral soil is preferred for more natural and sustainable situations. You can see how the soil actually you should supposed to be the seed bed should supposed to be done if it follows those simple procedures actually so i don't think we have a problem so the landscape fabrics are made from non-woven fabric they are biodegradable papers mulch or flexible geotextile fabrics this is just to show you how well managed urban farm are showing high production so it is always if you don't have enough space you can include pods as well as uh, seed bed bed so you can make sure you can use effectively your area as much as you can depend on how much land you have you're not necessarily this is a pot only or this is a seed bed only you can mix them depend on how much land you have and what kind of plant you plant this is a cover crops. One of the thing to avoid compaction. The best plant so normally works for most of the farmer is tillage radish. You can see the rest, right side how much that one is breaking the soil. It is just like a tractor. It breaks into pieces those compactions. So this is one of the best after harvest, early September or late. August, you can just right away plant, and that makes your soil actually good. At the same time, covering also help for living organisms and also uh, produce more uh, nutrients. Another one is a canola. That is also another one. The most nitrogen in the above ground biomass. That is the most nitrogen producing plant, and at the same time also it fertiles your soil. So that is also another one which can use. Hairy veg is another one. This is really one of the uh, plant which is actually has multi-purpose. It actually extracts nitrogen. At the same time, 
good weed suppression. Doesn't let any weed to grow. Improve soil aggregate stability and the water storage. And also retaining nitrogen to the soil. Especially for vegetables like tomato, corn, cucumber, and squash, that's the best to use. You can mix also winter mix cover. Uh, they absorb nitrogen in the air and they bring it into the soil. They are also beneficial for plants like rose, tomatoes, corn, cabbage, and more. They introduce more organic material back into the soil. They can even prevent weeds and improve the soil texture as well. So it will have to be very selective and also uh, based on the side we have and the time, look all these possibilities to use. High tunnel, uh, most of the people are using those in, in urban areas and as far as also in rural areas. Component, the primary organic matter, peat, moss, ba bark or wood chips, but add compost, about less than 25% volume. Add sand gravel, rarely material, less than one third of the volume. You have to make a ratio to make sure that all those things actually are in, in a good place. Physical properties critical. Water holding capacity, drainage, aeration. Those are the very critical so that we have to stick to the proportion of the volume of material we are using to make the cross component. This is another very hard job for urban farming. Mitigation of heavy metals such as lead and arsenic. As I always say, test to determine level across the site. Try to maintain soil pH 6 to 7 to help minimize absorption of lead by plant. Root crops most likely to contain any absorbed lead internal plus adsorbent lead external as i said on the leaf like lettuce they absorb it externally vegetables that pose low risk fruit crop fruiting crops wash vegetables carefully to remove soil and the dust deposit pale all root crops wear gloves to minimize exposure some people actually may not Consider that as, uh, as one of the mitigations, but it is to, to wear gloves. Cover any bare soil, prevent dust generation. Sold, immediate grass cover plus thin layer of new soil at the surface. Other wood chips, mulch or clean sand. Prevent indoor contact with lead. Avoid transporting soil into the house on shoes, clothing, or gloves. Frequent, frequent vacuuming or mopping. Regular cleaning of all surface, leafy or stock vegetables. That's most likely to have elevated lead from soil uptake. The sampling actually is to the lab when you take. You take some areas about four, 10 by 15 meter or about what, 30 by 45 feet. What you do sampling is you just go cross crisscross wise, probably about eight feet apart from each other, take those samples, then put together sub sample all of them and take one compost sample and send to lab. Then they do the test for you. When you sample, Always collect a representative soil sample of the site. Compost soil sample is made up of two or more combined sub samples to represent an area of garden. Urban soil sampling checklist, you need those. Create a diagram in the plan where you are going to take your soil samples. Make note of the name and address of the property. Draw a line around your garden using Polygon or tape or rock. Just what exists resource you have. The soil sample should be taken from the area that gardens use. A typical community garden will need only one or two soil samples. 
recommending that the compost soil sample is taken every 10, 15 by 15 feet. That's approximately 15 by 50 feet. Starting at one corner of the composite soil sample area, walk diagonally to the far corner and repeat making an X pattern. Mark the location of the sub sample approximately every eight feet using a polygon or some other marks. So it, it continue, then you have to mix and sample and write all these things. So I think those are the uh, general soil lab. There are other now technologies going on nowadays. I don't want to go into those details just to give you um, one idea that is a portable toolkit called PXRF. Uh, that is portable X-ray fluorescence. That is a very, very, very interesting machines coming up now other states are using so I don't go into the details since you haven't yet started here and in the, in the near future definitely we will discuss what the machine work is is analytical technique that returns information about the elemental composition of a sample the sample is illuminated with an x-ray beam and the atoms which are struck by the beam emit x-ray in response usually at the several different energies. Different elements produce different distributions of element X-rays. So the spectrum of emitting X-ray can be used to identify which elements are present in a sample. So it just go into the sample and read it. In three minutes, it reads you up to 25, 26 elements reading for you completely right away and give you a spreadsheet, which is connected to the computer on ArcGIS and immediately you got the form. So I think that's all the thing we do. We don't want to go into these details actually at this time. Uh, one thing I want to just add is, which will come up in the future is, we are always using the soil health assessment. Probably in the future we may consider having urban soil health assessments. Those are the thing I'm just considering from my point of view maybe important in the future to work on as an urban soil health assessment, the structure and the density of the soil because you are destroying the soil, aeration the drainage because you are impacting compaction, available water and permeability, potential rooting volume in the compaction, soil, react soil reaction in the fertility level, surface protection cover, and toxicity and mineral level. That is what we need. So probably we will work on the future on urban soil health assessment. In summary, urban soils are often very, very disturbed and have poor soil quality for plant production, but variability is high. Soil test is necessary to determine agronomic management factors and environmental risk. Remediation of poor quality soil is initiated with decompaction and or organic matter amendment, as well as fertilizer and lime, limestone if indicated by soil test. Contamination issue may be prevent use of in situ soil. In situ is a site soil. Raise bed options, minimum of 12, 12 inch mineral bed soil is recommended. Container planting with artificial growing me media, high management level. Minimize dust and exposure to bare soil through use of mulch. Wash hand thoroughly after contact with lead contaminated soil. Do not bring food or drink into area of contaminated soil. Maintain soil phosphorus level by applying the recommended amount of fertilizer to garden plot. Phosphorus can reduce lead uptake by plant. Maintain the soil pH between six to seven, applying limestone at a recommended rate to reduce availability of lead uptake by plant. Sources are, there are so many sources we can use. I am in a slide, maybe as a power, we'll get it later as a PDF. There are so different sources we have. Salt accumulation of sources, other, for other sources of uh, container soil. So there are sources you can refer to. And also the general analysis source, source of urban soil survey areas and mostly the urban technical note 
uh, of soil quality journal of 2018 is a good resource and 2020 is another source. And uh, I have my book, Heavy Metal Leaching in Different Environments, also another source if you are interested. And this is what I do have and uh, I'll give back to Yuri. Yuri, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry, my microphone was turned off. Okay. <laughs> um, I think, um, Kafen, you provide you provide us with a YouTube to share. Mm -hmm. Abigail, did you want to? Could you show that one? All right, this is the entrance to our farm. If you're from Oklahoma City, we're near Northwest 32nd and Western, so we're in a very residential neighborhood. We have about five vacant lot, well, formerly vacant lots, they're not vacant now, um, but lots where there were houses that have been torn down. We've converted them into growing space. We grow vegetables year-round, all four seasons, and sell them through our CSA, Community Sport of Agriculture, which we've affectionately nicknamed the Veggie Club, um, and also to restaurants. This is our vegetable farm manager, Tan. We also grow flowers, and our flower season is a bit shorter, but we sell flowers both to individuals, retail, and to restaurants. And this is Tessa, our flower farm manager. We also have a hoop house. We were fortunate to get a grant from one of the Thunder players, Kyle Singler, to build that hoop house. We did several community bills to put it together, and um, it's now verdant growing space. This is our compost heated greenhouse. More on that in a minute. Our food forest, fledgling food forest. We have several pollinator gardens. And as well as front yard and side yard gardens. We also have a whole composting operation, so we pick up food waste from Whole Foods and mix it with wood chips, compost 52 weeks of the year. And then that finished compost is the fertility basis base for our farm. We use drip irrigation. We've started doing rainwater collection. In addition to our staff, we have a whole host of volunteers. The essence of who we are is a, a community-based farm. We also do garden, a lot of educational activities, garden school classes, tours, and um, an apprenticeship program. This is our first crop of apprentices and staff in our most recent one. So let me talk now about bioremediation. How many of you have ever had your soil tested for toxins? Not very many. All right. So if you're growing in the city, you probably have soil that's been contaminated. And if you're growing out of the city, you may well have soil that's been contaminated. And um, there are many different kinds of contamination. So our first foray into bioremediation began at our community garden on Northwest 31st and um, Chartel. When we began, we first, um, very, very first began the community garden before we even planted anything, a friend said, you really ought to get that soil tested. There had been several houses there that had been torn down. And um, so we took, um, took a soil sample to a local lab and tested it for, um, chlor well, chloridane was the chemical that came back positive, and it had actually very high levels of chloridane. Anybody know what chloridane is? <laughs> it was used years ago for termites. It yeah. stays in the soil like forever. It, it does. Indeed, it does. Yeah, I think at one point it was listed on the top 20 for the EPA's most dangerous chemicals. Um, so it came back. Uh, showing high levels of chloridane, and we had no clue what to do. So Alan, my spouse, um, this was a good 15, maybe 20 years ago now, began doing a lot of research, much harder than before um, Google was um, like it is now. And so what we came to, um, we, did, we went to the various agencies and asked them what to do, and they really had no answer um, besides like remove all the soil, which would be like a quarter million dollars, and then what do you have? Um, one. <laughs> One, one person in the agency said, um, we'll just build a house on it and don't have a garden, which I thought was really ironic because what do you have in houses? Often children, and what do children do? They play outside in the soil. Um, so what we came to was that um, there are actually um, biological responses to human-created toxicity, which um, I think is just amazing that nature has answers for things that it didn't create. <laughs> So we began a process, this was at our community garden, we began a process of bioremediating for chlordane, and we tested the soil every six months. 
And it went from, um, I don't remember now the numbers, but it went from a very high level, just gradually, every six months, lower and lower, until at the end of um, two or three years, we did one plot intensively and one plot less intensively, and it was down to zero. So what we did, um, two things. One, we planted cover crops and started to reintroduce microbial life into the soil. And the other thing is we just brought in literally a ton of compost and applied it over the soil and plowed it in. So we did intentionally till and plow the soil in order to aerate it. So one of the things about chlorodane is that it tends to break down more in the presence of oxygen. So in this case, we were um, actually eager to break up the soil. Um, if you garden at home, <laughs> if you garden anywhere near the base of the house, you're, um, you really ought to be testing for toxins. Chlordane, being a termiticide, was sprayed around the base of a house. And if a house was um, either had termites or um, was sold, if it was sold, if a house was being sold, you could either spray for termites or you'd get it tested. And so oftentimes people would spray whether they had termites or not because it was cheaper or easier. In our case, because we're um, growing on vacant lots, um, usually the houses have been torn down and the soil's been spread around. So we have contamination over the whole lot. Now we've um, added lead as one of the toxins that we test for. Lead, of course, the primary concern is with children ages six and under. So this is one of our most recent bioremediation projects. This is what is now the flower lot at Commonwealth. When we first got it, we tested for chlordane and lead. It wasn't so high in chlordane, but it did show significant quantities of lead. Um, I think the initial test was a little bit under 400 parts per million, which the EPA standard of 400 is like considered safe but um, our bar is higher. <laughs> so we still consider that a need for bioremediation. So we went ahead and got the lot plowed, which also helped break up the Bermuda. And then we planted, began planting sunflowers. We planted sunflowers there for every summer for, I think it was three summers. So in our research, what, what we, um, well, we went on several wild goose chases first. What we eventually came to was that there were two ways that we could um, address lead. So unlike chlordane, which will break down into um, non-toxic components in the right, um, under the right conditions, oxygen and um, biological activity, lead is a heavy metal, so it doesn't break down into anything. It's just lead is lead. So sunflowers are supposed to be a, a good bioaccumulator for lead to pull lead out of the soil and um, collect it in their tissues. So we planted these sunflowers, which um, also looked really pretty, and um, then pulled them out of the ground, trying to get as much roots as possible and composted them in a separate pile. We also added literally a ton of organic matter in, with wood chips and, and leaf mulch. So um, I love it when a solution has multiple benefits beyond just the specific um, problem that you're trying to address. So by planting all these sunflowers and adding all this mulch, um, one, we provided a lot of um, pollinator habitat. We made the lot look really pretty during the summer. The soil started off being really heavy red clay. So by the end of this three-year process, we were working with a whole different type of clay than when we started. There was just a thick layer of compost over the whole lot. So this is that same lot not, uh, after we finished by remediating. The last test that we did, the lead was down to, um, I think it was about 76 parts per million. So I don't know how much of that was from the sunflowers um, acting as a bioaccumulator and how much was from just diluting it by adding a massive amount of organic matter. We also were on a steep slope, so we um, built this retaining wall, which gives an, a lovely face to that lot. Um, and this is a lot as it looks right now, full of flowers. We have a tiny urban farm. We're probably um, maybe a sixth of an acre in cultivation altogether, or a third of an acre in cultivation altogether, um, about half vegetables and half flowers. We've needed a greenhouse for a long time, and we've just um, just kind of patched it together as best we could. But last fall, I said to my team, we have to build ourselves a greenhouse, and we need to do it in a way that we're not having. OK, thank you, Abigail. And thank you, Kafeni, for an incredible presentation that was packed full of information. Um, I wanted to bring uh, this to a conclusion by talking about our Soil Your Undies campaign. So I'm going to share my screen here. And I think I'm going to turn my camera off just to save bandwidth. Can you all see uh, my screen? We can see that, yep. OK. So this is a, a campaign that we are launching at the end of this month. Um, 
there are four principles of soil health. One is to minimize the disturbance. Second is we want to keep the soil covered. Third is we want to maintain living plants and living plant roots as much as possible within the soil. And the fourth is to promote diversity, different kinds of plants, crop rotations, cover crops. And the idea is that these activities will help your soil microbes and a biologically active and healthy soil will be able to recycle nutrients, uh, decompose that chlordane that, that was talked about in the uh, YouTube there. And the way to prove that your soil is biologically active is possibly to bury a pair of 100% cotton underwear. So this was brought to you by the Pennsylvania Soil Health Coalition, which is a group of, of kind of like the who's who of Pennsylvania ag. And um, these PA Soil Health, Soil Health Coalition members are all um, interested in promoting soil health practices in Pennsylvania. So we have NRCS, we have Stroud, the Conservation Districts, Extension, Capital RCD, Grazing Lands Coalition, Pennsylvania Association of Sustainable Ag, Rodale, the Nature Conservancy, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Pennsylvania Department of Ag, the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance, SWCS, the State Conservation Committee, uh, Steve Groff, Cover Crops, and the 4R Alliance. But also there are private companies, at least one big one, the big favorite, which is a um, a undergarment company based in Pennsylvania that specializes in organic um, cotton materials. And they wanted to make this uh, connection between what we wear um, and soil health. So basically the soil under your challenge is, um, let me advance this, whoops, is that we want you to plant a pair of new cotton underwear in a hole about three inches deep in the site that you're curious about, your garden, your farm site, maybe your raised bed, wait at least 60 days and then gently unearth it. And this will give your soil microbes, if they are there, time to do their job. And if, they're, if your soil is healthy and biologically active, you won't have very much underwear left. And then send us a photo with a little bit of information about your operation. And um, we will eventually make a map, no, no personal identifiable in information, but just a map of where soils are, soil undies were buried <laughs> and um, some of the results that were found. And so you can download a flyer from the PA Soil Health Coalition at this website, www.pasoilhealth.org, soil your undies. And um, there is a form you can fill out, or I believe you can do it electronically. So we are just starting to launch this campaign. There, here's a picture of the PA Soil Health website, and it goes, uh, that link will take you directly to the Soil Your Undies, and you can actually sign up for the challenge. So you enter your name, email, and you will get regular posts about soil health, and uh, you will, um, receive our blog links, and I think that is also where you can upload information about the underwear that you're bearing. So we are launching, so plant your undies now through June 30th, and it, it's a really fun way to talk about soil health, either among your school groups, with your gardening club, with other farmers and landowners, and uh, we hope that you will join this challenge. All right, well, that ends the formal part of our presentation. So uh, we have about five minutes left to answer some questions, if we can. <laughs> yeah, thanks, or, thanks, Yuri. Uh, this is Abigail, and uh, I had a couple of things I wanted to recap for people joining. I put some links in the chat. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what those things are while people are typing their questions into the chat. Uh, this is farmers.go forward slash urban. It, uh, it has been updated and I wanted to point out that now there's an urban ag programs at a glance, which is a great new tool. This is the updated toolkit. If you have seen the urban ag toolkit in the past, uh, now it's been updated to reflect current programming and funding that is available and assistance that is available. So I highly recommend that you check that out. 
I also want to point out that today's recording is going to go on our urban ag videos here at NRCS in Pennsylvania webpage. Uh, we have a couple of other webinars recorded and other videos that may be helpful to you. And we do have an urban ag webpage here in PA. I'm going to uh, look to the chat for questions and I'm also going to be sharing for you contact information for Yuri and Kafeni today if you have follow up and certainly reach out to me at any time. So here we go in the chat. Abigail, we have as you're reading those off. I'm going to uh, share a screen also. Um, these are the new urban practices uh, that NRCS is offering in fiscal year 2022. So let me share Terrific. that as well, if that's Thanks, okay. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah, that's great. Um, we do have a question in the, in the chat. Has Dr. Kajela done any work to evaluate the accuracy of PXRF or to calibrate it against other methodology? <laughs> that is really a great question. And uh, that is a question I also forwarded from my side to those who actually worked for the last five, six, seven years in, that, up in New Jersey. We haven't done anything here, but theoretically what there are two things the PXR have, have actually a, uh, a drawback. One, if the soil samples are too wet, extremely wet, the reading is not perfect. So they recommend, therefore, extremely wet soil, which is the wetness is above uh, uh, field capacity to keep the soil at least to some degrees as far as, as much as possible so that it's a little dry before they run the test. That is something I learned. This is one. The second thing is, as I said earlier, if the soil on some geology, like I said, limestone areas, the reading actually give very high. So it includes the limestone content of calcium in the soil and at the same time the paved ground from the cement on the top of disturbed soil. So the mixture of those two gives you a misleading reading. So the best thing they do is take the sample from urban soil with limestone area and go out of the city on the same geology, take sample and run the soil test and compare both readings, you get definitely a different result. Then you can come to the conclusion that yes, the soil is contaminated. So those are the true uh, setbacks actually we found and there are uh, other minor things which will come up with in the near future. And I think um, uh, the PA will have this machine in the near future, so we will get much more uh, uh, experience and uh, ourselves learn. We haven't done yet here, so this is just I want to share with you from other states. Okay, that's what I want to say now. Yeah, thank you, Kafani. Um, we had another request to share the name of the farm or farmer from the video, so I have shared the link to the video. Um, I didn't know, Kafani, if you wanted to say anything about your connection there. What, what is it? What is the video? The the Oklahoma State University video that we shared. Yeah, they are actually. I'm a graduate from Oklahoma State University, and those ones are related to Oklahoma State University Agronomy and the Soil Department. They are attached to work together. So I just go through uh, through the OSU, so uh, I got the information from them. So I just am a member of alumni and then I they share with me uh, that information from Oklahoma State University. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and currently there are no other questions in the chat. So if you have any burning questions um, you'd like to ask, now is the time. Here's one. Um, in the video, there is a simplistic explanation of bioremediation. They failed to mention that for contaminants that don't break down biologically, the plant material needs to be removed to an off-site location in order to remediate. Uh, thank you for that comment. Um, Kafeni, did you want to say anything to that? I think that's what uh, he said. Is That's what exactly I'm about to say. Exactly, that's the same thing I have in my mind. And I think the different reading, yeah. Okay, thank you. 
And then also, is this a comprehensive list of um, practice scenarios that are urban farming? Is there a location where these are shared or updated? I will have to. Um, this was a presentation that our program staff gave, and um, I believe this is a fairly comprehensive list, although there are many more. Let me see. There are many more. Um, yeah, RCS practices that maybe don't necessarily relate to urban sites. Um, so I can find out. If this is listed anywhere in particular, or I can send this. Um, this particular presentation to you. Yuri, um, can you flip back to the list of the new yes. practice scenarios though? There, yep. um, so um, Todd, I just want to respond by saying that this has been recorded. The, the um, webinar about this has been recorded. These slides are also available on that PA Urban Ag videos web page. You'll find them there um, separate from the recording, but also included in the recording. And these are the new practice scenarios that were adopted with higher payment rates for the um, urban equip areas in Pennsylvania. Different states uh, have adopted maybe a portion of them or maybe have not adopted them yet at all. And I also recognize that there are a couple of folks from the OUAIP on here, the Office of Urban Ag and Innovative Production. Um, so I'm going to call on Maggie if you don't mind, um, if you'd like to say a couple more words here. Hey, Abigail. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you pretty much said what I was going to say, Todd. This is... Um, a list of some of the urban payment scenarios and I guess urban is something that we reached for for the first year of these revisions but you're going to see words like small acreage small system um, <clears throat> moving forward for payment scenarios uh, just because we're trying to get uh, trying to make sure everything stays neutral or operation neutral so we're focusing on the scale because oftentimes uh, producers that are working at that scale do more hand labor um, and uh, there is usually more expense to buying things at smaller numbers, like cost per unit. So that's why these payment scenarios are different. Um, yeah, but the, the conservation practices, uh, those are all available and could definitely be useful depending on the resource concerns that your producers are experiencing. And then you just wanna match those uh, conservation practice standards with the payment scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to, 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 to add to that point, and when I look at the list, exactly you are right. This, this all practices, when we, if we look through carefully, it has exactly actually related a tie to the urban farming. It's just exactly like equip and AMA, like irrigations are related to urban farming. So. These are more of the one I tried to talk before, the cover crop, the compactions, the, uh, the water system. Those are more of the management aspects of the practices of the urban farming. So those are exactly what the urban farming activities are related to. Yeah, that's true. Thank you both. All right, seeing no other questions in the chat at this point, I'd like to wrap things up. Um, any final comments from Yuri or Kafeni? Just thank you, Abigail, for organizing the seminar. And thank you, Kafeni, for a really information packed presentation. And thanks for everybody that joined the webinar today. It was quite a diverse group. Absolutely. Thank you both so much and thank you all for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.